We usually sit this way um, to do things a little bit different from we normally do because when we sit, usually when we sit facing forward, most of the time we're just simply listening. And I, I, I think, you know, for us to be the church, uh, we also need to be able to participate and, and, and also um, really understand that our stories together as the people of God intertwine. And usually when we sit this way, we want to do something a little different. Well, we can see each other face to face, and uh, I'm going to also have you break up into a group of uh, uh, three or four, preferably with someone you don't know that well. And we're going to have some questions to process through together as the body of Christ. Uh, but before we start, would you join with me in a word of prayer? Uh, Jesus, we want to uh, acknowledge that you are here, and you are the one that sets the captives free. Uh, Holy Spirit, your presence allow us to uh, be able to be sensitive uh, and, and for our hearts to be sensitive to uh, what you're doing. And, and so, Holy Spirit, uh, we have no agenda, uh, just simply that uh, you will move and that uh, you will work. Uh, God, uh, we do not want to just hear words. Uh, God, that uh, we want to be able to tangibly experience your presence. Uh, so that change can take place in our life. Uh, we confess, Lord, that our life may not always be great, and our thoughts may not always be great. But Jesus, we want you to come. Holy Spirit, we want you to come into this room. We want you to fill this place and this space. We want you to fill us and awaken us to a whole new possibility uh, with you leading and guiding in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been going through this sermon series called Renovation, Church Under Construction. And I, I, I think it is so important for us to rethink and to re-approach uh, the way that we see and we view the church. Because most of the time, we, we have a certain idea of what church is. Uh, over the centuries, I, I think uh, over the last, in particular, the last uh, 30, 40 years of church history, church has really been just a place you go to. And they are supposed to provide uh, activities, events for you to participate. Uh, church is a place where, quote unquote, you perform your religious duties uh, so that uh, you can get on with your life. And, and so church has just simply become a place or a space where people go to, uh, quote unquote, to do their religious activities. And, and so in order to attract the crowd nowadays, churches need to have the whole, what I call the package. That is, you need to have at least a children's ministry, a youth ministry. You need to have great lighting cameras. You need to have a great worship team. It will be great if you even had uh, you know, a smoke machine and all the flashing lights and you know, loud, everything's comfortable. And after that, you provide coffee and you, know, you can even have like a website where they can worship from the comfort of their own homes and all that stuff. And the language we tell everybody who comes to church is, we're here to serve you because we really want you to feel at home. That's often the language that we tell people in church. But I think that is something that needs to radically change because the only people that we will ever get to church are people, quote, quote, have a relationship with Jesus. Because the church is more than just a place where Christians can be comfortable and isolated from the world. And, and so we need to have a radical reconstruction and uh, thought process of church. Uh, in order for that to happen, we also need to have a radical rethought process of what the gospel of Jesus Christ really means. Uh, for most of us, when we think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we basically say, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus died for me. And if I believe in him, I will have eternal life. Most of us got up and said, yeah, that's the gospel. So, as true as that statement is, it is missing something. And we built the church around that statement. That if you believe in Jesus, then you will be saved, and that's all it matters. And that is the premise in which we view our life with Jesus. But... I think there's more to the gospel than just simply that you will have eternal life. The gospel, if that is it, if that is all the gospel is, then 
why bother living for Jesus? Why bother going to church on Sundays and worship? Why bother working hard? Why bother with developing a relationship with God, with people, with the world? Why bother? If that is it, because if I have Jesus and I have a relationship with him, if I believe in him, then I have eternal life. If that is the ultimate goal of my life, then I don't need to care about anything else. And I think that's where we as a church have shaped ourselves. And so we need to rethink what the gospel is in the context of what it means to be the church. And so we've been going through a sermon series kind of hopefully changing the way that you think about church and the way that you view church so that we can truly be a family of God in fully embracing the totality of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So today I just kind of want us to land on a little passage uh, that speaks about the vibrant life of the early church, uh, uh, of the believers in the early church, and what did it look like, and what drove them, and how actually this brings the glue together of all we've been talking about the last seven weeks. So Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35 reads, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of Jesus, and God's grace was so powerful at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the cells, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Now, most of us, when we read this passage, we just say, this is communism. <laughs> or socialism, whatever you want to call it. Um, no. This is a beautiful picture of the church of God, the people of God, right? And when we look at this passage, I, I think one thing sticks out. First and foremost, they had a common purpose. They had a common purpose. I mean, imagine this. We, in here, this group is radically different. This, this group in here is radically different. We, we have a radically different group. In fact, I would like, I, I continue to pray that our church will not be a homogenous church, that it will be radically mosaic in, in, in who we are. So I, I want this church to be a mosaic in, in, in generations, mosaic in ethnicity and culture, because that, <laughs> that in itself speaks about the radical power of Jesus uh, of bringing people together. And as you can look in here, we're getting there. And, and so this basically means that in, in order for us to realize this, that we're different people. And to, if you notice, when people are different, it makes it very hard to have a common purpose. Now, it makes it very, because I, just later on, when you, some of you go out for lunch, just figure out, like, going, figure out what to eat is already a very difficult decision to make. Because to share a common purpose, to say, hey, we want to eat the same thing, that's already a very radical decision to make, right? Some of you are going, no, that's not, because I don't really care what I eat. But for some, it's tough, right? But to just think about eating a meal together, to have a common purpose, that's already when you have different types of people together coming together for that, it's tough. Now, all of a sudden, you have the church of God, and the one thing that brought them together, they, had, they shared a common purpose. Because in verse 32, it says, the believers were one in heart and mind. You cannot be one in heart and mind if you did not center around a common purpose. And for us as a church, there is one common purpose that cannot divide us, separate us. And that is the gospel, the whole gospel. Not just the one that says that you have eternal life, but the one that says that the kingdom of God is here and now, and it is radically transforming me, you, and everyone else in the world, right? Because it says here that the apostles continue to testify the resurrection of Jesus, right? Most of us says that Jesus died for me on the cross. That basically means he took away my sins, and I don't have to face the punishment of my sins, 
But the resurrection of Christ says that there is a whole new way of life. Not just in eternity, but here and now. That is our common purpose. And so what that basically means is that, listen, if your relationships are broken with people, the resurrection power of Christ can change that. If you have struggles with your life issues, the resurrection power of Christ can change that. You, you have problems at your work, the resurrection power of Christ can change that. If you have problems with your own brokenness, the resurrection power of Christ can change that. You have problems with each other here, the resurrection power of Christ can change that. Because if the gospel is only about eternal life, man, our life sucks. Because there's no hope then for this life. Then why should we even continue bother trying? But there is hope in this life. And when we gather together as the people of God, when we become the church of God, we are saying that the gospel of Jesus matters to us. This is why we gather together. The gospel of Jesus is that it is the cross and it is his kingdom. The cross says he died for my sins. The kingdom says that he rules, that he rules over my life, he rules over my problems, he rules over my brokenness, he rules over the situations and the problems of this world and of everything that goes around. That Christ has power over everything. That is our common purpose. That Jesus is king and he rules, even though we don't think that he does. That's why we as a church gathering, that's why we worship. We worship not so that we can sing some cool songs and have a glorified karaoke. We, we, we sing not so that we can you know, feel good. We gather together not so that we like each other. Because quite honestly, when you have different people, it's hard. It's hard to like each other. It's hard to be on the same page. When we, we have different age gap, when we have different cultures, we have different thought process, different personalities, it is hard. But when Jesus is king, and when Jesus rules, it's possible for us to be the church. So this is our common purpose. The gospel is our common purpose. The gospel is, <laughs> is for me. It is for you. And the gospel isn't about just Jesus died for your sins and you can go to eternal life and you can check out in this life. But the gospel is God can and will do something in me, through me, and with me. That the gospel is about a king who rules and a king that's determined to bring his kingdom to this world, to the here and now. That is the gospel. That is the common purpose that gathers us together. It's not about being the same, thinking the same, liking the same. But it is the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. And it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that not only brings us together as the family of God, but it changes the way that we relate with each other changes the way that we relate with the world, our neighbors, our workplaces, our problems. It radically changes us. And so that is why we are the church. Not for the extras. It's, the extras look pretty good. But this is what brings us together. And if this is what brings us together, we, we, we talked about accountability needs to take place among each other. We, we, we need to share life together. We, we, we need to personally own our own brokenness too. Right? It, it, it says that we, we need to reshape the way that we become a family, that it's okay to be different. Right? It, it says that we need to be in each other's life. Right? Look at this passage. They were in each other's life, and because they were in each other's life, and because the gospel was such a, intricate part of their life, the outpour of it was generosity, 
right? Is generosity. It isn't about, you know, when we look at this verse, we, all we can think of is about money. It's not just about money. It says everyone's needs were being met. You can't meet everybody's needs if, if people in the community you belong to weren't generous, generous with their time, generous with, with, with relationships, generous with love. And, and so we have to be that church. We have to radically change that. We have to be people who are generous with our time, with our relationships, with our love. Because that is a byproduct of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our life and in the lives of each other. That's the church. That's what we strive to be. But the way that you and I live our life, this is how we live our life. And we say it's okay. Go to church on Sundays for an hour and a half. When you have a problem, pray to Jesus, have him fix it. But go back to your normal way of living. Have nothing to do with each other. Work your own jobs. Live your own world. When we gather together, have superficial conversations in the hallway and say, hi, how you doing? And the response that all of us expect from each other we're doing fine. No, we're not. But if we were even dare to say that we're not doing fine, people naturally and normally will give us a sign that we don't really want to talk about that. That's church. That's what really church is. And so if we keep people entertained enough, then we don't have to really deal with the problems. But that's not the church that Jesus is building. That's not church that you and I want to be. And so we have to be generous with our time with each other, generous with <laughs> allowing people to come into our life. That's scary, right? And letting people into our life, that's scary. But we have to be generous in allowing people to be a part of our life. We have to be generous in, in giving people the opportunity even to speak truth into our life. We need to be generous with how we love each other. And if we don't do that, I would say we can't be a church because I really don't want to be the alternative. I don't want to be a part of a church that just simply people show up on Sunday where I'm the superstar. All I got to do is preach a good sermon and that's it. I don't care if you change. It's not my problem. As long as you give offering and I can have a paycheck, then that's fine. Or, you, you know, I grow a huge church and I go on national level and I'll go to the national circuits and preach, you know, five sermons every year and make a killing, write a book, you know, put my face on Time Magazine, whatever. Number one bestseller, that's, that's the strive of what some pastors want to be. I don't want to be that. I, I, I want to to be able to be generous with my life, with my time. I want people to be a part of my life. I want people to be a part of my family. Because as a church, we're family. Because we all share in one gospel, one common purpose. All right. So I've said enough what I wanted to say. Now I'm going to ask that you would split up into a group of three or four. Preferably someone you don't usually talk to. And we're going to process through these questions. Uh, husbands and wives, please separate. <laughs> because you two here, you guys hear enough of each other. <laughs> Sometimes you need vitamin, not. Uh... <laughs> uh, so, so why don't we huddle into a group of three or four? And there are a few questions I want you to process through. Together, share, right? I don't want to talk. I, I want you guys to share life. That's the church. Be generous. Be generous with your time, with your life. Share. Let's process it through this. Okay, can you put up the questions? Right, right. So, right. These are the questions. What is our common purpose? What does it mean to you? Right? Right? Uh, what are we called to be generous with? What does that mean to you? What is preventing you from embracing us as family? 
All right? What do you need to stop in order to embrace this as your family? And what would you need to start doing in order to embrace this as your family? Share, talk, right? Three to four people because everyone should share. And then, you know, give us like 20 minutes and then we'll come together and respond to God. Okay? 20 minutes. kind of want to share with you how generosity will look like uh, in the family of God, right? Now, as you know, Daniel and Jean rarely goes out to their backyard, <laughs> and so <laughs> they, they haven't done much to it. And so I, I have a power wash at home, and I, I said to them, I say, hey, you know, I, I can help out if you need to help power wash. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, we just need to power wash our, our, our patio set. So I said, okay, let, let me figure out time, you know, I figure, all right, I can help Daniel since, I mean, you know, Daniel's with, with Joshua, and I said, I'll do it, you know, you watch Joshua. So I, I was going to watch the power, and I think that's all they wanted to do. Then I saw the deck, and I saw the walls, and I said, you know, they're having a party here. This would look kind of awkward if they had guests here. Uh, so I, I began to power wash their, you know, the patio. I power wash their, you know, siding. I power wash their gate. I, I, yeah. yeah. So, um, but I, and and that that was one way for me to show them generosity, uh, of us being a a family together. Um, because one, I you know I don't think they they were expecting for me to do that. They just figure out, help out with the, you know, with the table a little bit. And, and so that they'll have guests over and, and that. But that's for me to be able to express generosity. Now, uh, on the day in, in, in which uh, they were having guests over, uh, you know, I, I got a few texts from Daniel asking me a lot of questions about barbecuing. And so it, it's about like, you know, 9, 30, 10, and, you know, party's going to start around like 11, 11, 30. And so I was getting a lot of, I was answering Daniel, and then I said to Candace, I said, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I don't think Daniel can barbecue that many things together. He seems a little hesitant, and so he's a little questions about this. So I, I, I said to Candace, I said, um, maybe we should go over there a little earlier to help out. Now, mind you, I have two young kids, all right, four and a half and two Right? And, and so we, we decided, yeah, this is one way where we can bless them in, in helping them out so they don't have to worry about all the nuance so that they can celebrate a very special moment for, for their young child. So we decided to go over there a little early and, and help out. You know? And you know me, when I help out on the grill, it means leave me alone. <laughs> so that, you know, that they, they can have that opportunity to enjoy uh, the presence of people and, and really entertain and and host the people that were coming, right? It, it, these are very little things that we can do as a church family in being generous, right? And, you know, we were going to be there anyway. Um, it, it wasn't really going out of our way, but it was just a little extra to be generous. Now, I, I share this not to elevate, you know, how great we are, but just to uh, say that, you know, generosity as a family of God is not as hard when we're willing to just take the little step, right? And, and imagine how infectious that would be if we did that for each other. Like just a little extra step. I, I, I know we live in a world that right now says, that basically tries to choke us out because we are, we are slaves to our jobs. And not only are we slaves to our jobs, uh, we have a mistress called our commute. Right, for those of us who, who work, work a little further or a, a little further from home, we have a mistress as well called our commute time. Right? And on top of that, we have another mistress called the, the time of, of the world that says that we must have in order to be somebody. Right? And that really chokes out a lot of, of, of communal life where the only communal life we have is then is our immediate nucleus. Right? But imagine what this family would be if we said to those things, you're not my king. 
Jesus is. And imagine how, how much love we would feel, how much support we would feel, and if we all did that together. It was mutual. It wasn't one person was a black hole and always needed it. Right? That it was infectious. I will tell you this. We won't even need to tell people <laughs> that you need to go to church because they say, I want to be a part of what you guys are. Because that is what I want to be a part of. That is the type of family I want to. That is the type of community I want to be a part of. Right? And, and I believe that it starts very simply by us recognizing what our common purpose is, is that we, our common purpose is we believe in the same gospel. And this gospel is about the cross and about his kingdom. And because of that, and then as we begin to put ourselves in a posture of, of thinking and being generous to each other, right? Because if we're generous to each other, I think that reciprocates, doesn't it? Generosity is infectious. You just naturally reciprocate it. And imagine if we were that together as the family of God. That's amazing. And I think that's the type of church you and I need to build. So I'm going to invite uh, Dave to come up and lead us in the time of worship. Now, I know you have a lot, your own stops and starts, uh, but... That's something I, I would like to challenge you to, to think through, right? And so as Dave's leading us in a time of, of, of worship and responding to Jesus, I, I, I believe that I believe that when we yield to the Holy Spirit's agenda, when we yield to what the Holy Spirit is doing, that amazing things happen, right? I, I, I look at every single individual in this room, and I want this to be family, right? Because church shouldn't be just an organization where you're a piece of a machine, and all people care about is how you're behaving or how you're not behaving, how you're contributing, or how you're not contributing. But church should be family, where everybody matters, right? If you're struggling, then how do we come alongside you and help you in your struggle, <laughs> right? How do we help you overcome to experience the fullness of the gospel of Jesus that says he is king, and he can do something about the brokenness and 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 the issues that you face. Because we're together in this, like it or not. We're family. Now, you can choose not to be a part of this family. That's your every right to do so. Right? You can choose that. That's your every right to do so. But when you choose to be a part of this family, we need to be generous to, with each other. That's a family that is united together. That's a family uh, that loves each other. That's a family that takes the extra steps to be there for each other. And that is infectious. Like I said, I don't know um, what, which individual wouldn't want to be a part of a family like that. Right? Even need to say to our neighbors, hey, you need to know Jesus because they say, yes, got it, man. That's cool. I like that. I want to be a part of that. As Dave is leading us in a time of response, you know, as you share it in your group and also as you're personally processing. So, what is preventing you? What is holding you? back from being a part of the family of God. What is holding you back? Because obviously it's preventing you from experiencing the fullness 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that is what needs for Jesus to be Lord over that. That's what he needs to rule over. Because if he's not ruling over that, forget it. There's no way you'll ever experience the wholeness of, of, a, of, a, of a church family. Because we can talk about how you can start being generous. We can talk about how you can make time. But reality is talk is cheap. You can't start something and you stop that. So, as Dave's leading us in a time, allow the Holy Spirit to work with you. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Just be truthful with the Holy Spirit. Say, this, yeah, this is what I'm holding on to. It has power over me. And I don't want it. If we can acknowledge that before God, let Him take over. And he will. That we feel that uh, we're standing alone by ourselves. And that if if that the whole purpose almost of our life was that we're doing everything by ourselves that we're all alone in whatever we do. And yet, uh, <laughs> the words I got was, Jesus is saying, look around you. Look around you. There are people there. You're not alone. You don't have to do this alone. That's where some of us are feeling. That we're all alone with our problems. We're all alone with our own brokenness. We're all alone with our frustrations. But look around. Look around. Not only look around with there to help us to look around also who God is inviting you to be generous with who is God inviting you to welcome people into your life so we're not alone my prayer. My prayer is that no longer we'll begin to see and view ourselves as all alone in this world. No longer will we try to strive and to accomplish things with only two hands, with our own hands, but that we will begin to see that there is people to our left and there's people to our right. And they are walking with us side by side. Some of us are or may not be in great shape on certain areas of our life. But they are walking side by side with us. And that is what Jesus is calling us to do. To walk side by side with each other. To love each other. To be a family together. And so I bless each one of us in this room to receive what the Holy Spirit has for us, to understand and to receive, to receive the fact that we are part of a family. And for some of us, that word family means a lot of brokenness and a lot of hurt. But this family, the one that Jesus is inviting us into, is one that is filled with love, filled with generosity. Well, hope.